Thank you for joining me, Jane Davidson, Chair of the Wales Inquiry for the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission, to have a chat with Carwin Jones, an old political colleague, someone who's been Agriculture Minister, Environment Minister and First Minister of Wales, and who will be retiring from the Welsh Parliament at the next election in May 2021. I'm particularly pleased to be having this conversation with Carwin as part of Trade Unwrapped, a food farming and countryside commission project designed to explore what matters to us in Wales and in the UK as we build new trading relationships with the world. In addition to Carwin's political credentials, Carwin is also a barrister. So who best for me to talk to about what the effects are going to be of Brexit and the Internal Market Bill and what we might want to consider in Wales as you move forward. Carwin, it's a real pleasure to see you again. Tell me, what do we need to worry about in the context of this bill? Well, what is this bill for a start? Well, Jane, first of all, it's good to see you and uh, great to be uh, talking to you again. I know we, we talked to each other not that long ago as well and uh, great to be able to carry on with an important conversation because the Internal Market Bill uh, seems pretty innocuous, but it carries with it without being too dramatic, the seed of the UK's own breakup uh, if it goes very badly. Now, the idea behind the Internal Market Bill is a sound one, and that is there shouldn't be artificial barriers to trade across the UK, and there should be a level playing field in terms of rules. We would want, for example, you know, there'd be different rules on subsidies in England compared to Wales, for example. So the idea behind it is sound. But the problem is, first of all, the way it's been done, and secondly, what the bill contains. In a sensible world, there would have been many discussions before now between the different governments in the UK to agree a common set of rules across the UK. Now, that hasn't happened. What we've had is one government in Westminster telling everybody else what's going to happen without any input from the devolved governments. Now, that is a recipe for conflict. And you know, if things were to get very difficult, it would cause even greater pressure on the UK, which is itself under strain at the moment. So. The way in which it's been done is not helpful. If they'd been discussed, it's not too late to do this, but if there'd been common frameworks agreed, uh, as was agreed actually between the governments uh, some uh, 18 months ago, then we wouldn't be in this position. There would be far more confidence and faith in the process, which at the moment is very much, very much lacking as far as the devolved governments are concerned, because they've had no, um, no say in how the, uh, the, the frameworks are, are actually um, are actually implemented. So, I mean, essentially, obviously, we have to have um, we have to have a piece of legislation that governs what happens in trade um, across all the UK countries post Brexit. I mean, I I, I, I get that. Um, the legislation itself, what 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 is it absolutely designed to do? What are its core provisions? Well, it's designed to eliminate any kind of direct or indirect discrimination in, within the UK internal single market to ensure that there aren't, for example, different and uh, distorting subsidy regimes in different parts of the UK and to make sure there's a free flow of goods and services between the different countries of the UK. Now, nobody's going to argue with that, but the difficulty is that the bill itself uh, attacks devolution in a fundamental way or two fundamental ways, in fact. First of all, when it comes to trade, what the bill seeks to do is say, well, if regulations are approved in one part of the UK, set a particular standard, then all other governments in the UK have to follow it. What does this mean? It means, for example, if the, the government in London decided it would accept lower standards for food, for example, than any other government in the UK, everybody would have to follow those standards. And also, um, food labelling standards would have to be the same as well. So the Welsh Government potentially would have to accept lower standards on food and also not be able to enforce the labelling of that food in order to ensure people knew it was of a lower standard. So, and the same applies for any other government in the UK, where, for example, the Scots might, you know, I, I, this is hypothetical, hypothetical, the Scots might say, we're going to have a lower standard in a particular area. Everybody else would have to accept it, whether they liked it or not. Now, that clearly is, is a fundamental problem. So does, I mean, from, from what you're saying, that, that feels to me as though there's, there's two things which should really worry everybody in Wales. And I mean, particularly in the context of the work of the Food and Farming Commission, which is looking for high agroecological standards. 
the, the first worry that we should have is that devolution has been quite a force for good, I believe, in the UK, because um, well, if you just take an example that you and I were both involved in, you know, the, when, when we launched the, the uh, carrier bag charge within four years, that was delivered across the whole of the United Kingdom. So devolution has been good in, in testing new ideas and where people have considered them good, they have been then taken forward by other countries. But what you're saying in here is that actually this will ride roughshod over the devolution settlement, the ability of Wales to make its own laws, even the areas for which it was responsible, and actually drive standards down when everything we've heard in Wales uh, is about driving standards up. But I thought that's what the UK government were also saying. That's not what the bill says, unfortunately. What the bill will do is enforce the lowest standards in any part of the UK on the rest of the UK. Uh, so there, there'd be no scope for Wales having higher standards, for example, when it comes to, when it comes to food, if England decides to have lower standards. The, the lowest standard always wins. Now, there is an exception, but it's a partial exception. What is already in place is protected. So, for example, the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act, that is protected. Uh, the carry bag charge is, is protected. Anything that's already here now does not form part of the provisions of the bill in terms of discrimination. But the problem is, if an administration makes a substantial change to a piece of legislation, then they lose control over it. Uh, basically, it's the lowest standard that applies from then on in. Now, define substantive change uh, in, in a way you want. The courts will be kept very, very busy, no question about that. Let's say, for example, uh, the Welsh Government decided it wished to amend the Wellbeing of Future Generations uh, Act. Uh, if the court decided that amount is just a substantive change, then the whole act would fall, effectively. Uh, it, even the act that was there before would fall because uh, it would be seen as discrimination and the lower standards across the UK would apply. So there is that protection, but it's only a protection as long as you don't do anything to change the law. That is extraordinary. So we end up at the moment with a bill that's been having to be made very quickly because of the fact that a deal um, doesn't look as though it's going to be reached at this point, having an impact that says all our legislation passed so far, and of course we've only had devolved nations in the UK since 1999, has now to be set in stone and cannot be changed unless it potentially could fall because it would be to a higher standard than that delivered elsewhere. Is that is that right? Yes, if you want to uh, keep control over the legislation you have passed, then the safest way of doing that is not to pass any more legislation or not to amend the legislation you've already passed. Otherwise, you run the risk of losing control of the whole, the whole area that, uh, that you previously had full control over. So you said a few moments ago that um, uh, one way through, which, which you've been advocating for a long time, is about common frameworks. How could common frameworks help us to deal with this issue? Because, you know, what the UK government is saying um, in rhetoric, I suppose it's, it's, it's fair to say, if, it's, if they're saying one thing and the, and the bill is doing another, what they're saying in rhetoric um, is that this will actually give more powers to the devolved nations uh, in terms of actions. So what are the best ways in protecting the devolved nations? Because obviously the interests of Wales, um, you know, in a sense, they might be different in uh, legislative delivery, but the impact will be the same, I assume, on Scotland and Northern Ireland as well as Wales. So there is a, an interest in all the devolved nations having a clear understanding and potentially working together in terms of ensuring that there can be different outcomes in the context of this process. Well, the fundamental problem lies in the fact that the UK government has a conflict of interest that it cannot resolve. And that is that the UK government, when it comes, for example, to agriculture or the environment, is in fact the English government. Yeah. Uh, and so what confidence could devolved governments have that the UK government would act in the interest of all the countries of the UK rather than just England? That's the major problem that causes a, an immediate loss of confidence in the, in the current process. What common frameworks would have done is brought everybody together, got agreement from all four governments, on a common set of rules that everybody had confidence in. And also, of course, uh, being able to have a body that would interpret and enforce those rules. Mm -hmm. Now, what the Internal Market Bill suggests 
is the establishment of an office of the internal market, which would look to give an opinion on disputes, but not resolve them. It would give recommendations. So it would be perfectly possible for any government to ignore whatever the Office of the Internal Market actually said. And the reason why it, it hasn't got any more power is because the UK government and the UK Parliament don't want it to have power over them. And because of that, it can't have power over any, anybody else either. So we've got this toothless body that can opine but can't do anything, whereas what we actually need is a some you know, the equivalent of the European Court of Justice uh, that can actually look at a commercial issue and give an opinion that everybody has to has to keep to, and we don't have that in this uh, current setup. And again, the, the fact that there isn't an objective, arm's length decision making body that will interpret the rules is another weakness of the bill. Uh the bill, when it was first published, um, was very clear that the UK government was going to ask for the legislative consent of the devolved nations. Now, I know from everything I've read, and also, of course, we particularly had the motion of regret um, in the House of Lords last night. So we know that, in fact, outside the, um, the UK government and their action as an English government in the context of this um, bill in relation to agriculture, which is devolved, we've got a situation whereby if the UK government delivers on that commitment, then the bill as it is at the moment could not pass. Is, is it your view that the UK government will listen to the concerns of the devolved nations um, and the, potentially their colleagues in the House of Lords and, and change the bill accordingly? I doubt it, but they should because this bill will cause so much tension in the UK that I think it will break up the UK. I've always said that um, Brexit done badly, and this is not a dispute about Brexit, uh, carries with it the seed of the UK's own disintegration. And this bill will do just that. It, it's, it's a recipe for conflict. It's also a recipe for you know, booking a permanent spot in the Supreme Court, uh, because that's where we'll be uh, week in, week out, because of the way the bill has been framed. And there is an alternative. That's the, that's the sad thing about it. Uh, you know, the government can do what it wants with the majority of 80. I mean, of course, the problem with Parliament is it's subject to no laws. The place that makes the laws uh, for the UK is itself the most lawless institution in the UK, is the, um, the paradox of it. But bear in mind, you mentioned there the need for consent from the devolved legislatures. That's just the convention. There's no law. In fact, the whole British Constitution is a load of conventions. There's no law behind it at all. There's nothing, there's nothing law that says that the UK Parliament is supreme at all. It's all based on the view of one man in the 19th century, literally. So we know that conventions can be broken. There's no legal uh, way of, of, uh, of enforcing a convention. So, for example, if the Welsh Parliament decided not to give its consent to the Internal Market Bill, the UK government doesn't have, doesn't have to listen at all. And there's nothing that anybody else can do about it. They'll simply say, well, you know, it's, these, are, these are unusual times and that's it, which shows really that the convention of getting devolved legislators consent when the UK Parliament seeks to legislate in areas that are devolved is, is worthless, is becoming worthless. And it's really, again, it comes back to this point, we don't have a properly functioning constitution in the UK, and when it's put under strain like this, uh, it fails. I mean, interestingly enough, there was um, the, the, there's often been a um, commentary that the legislation made in haste is repented at leisure um, and one one used often for that kind of discussion was the dangerous dogs act yeah. and it feels to me that potentially with all the impacts of this bill that um, hopefully there are some opportunities for parliament to reconsider elements of it and in the context of the food farming and countryside commission and in particular protecting the ambition of the Food, Farming and Countryside Commission here in Wales to use the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act and its commitment to not only maintain but enhance standards of biodiversity, to create new, innovative, prosperous, low-carbon um, economies. Um, how, how can we seek potentially to take that forward? What kind of amendments would we need to the legislation? What kind of recommendations might you give us in terms of um, action we might take in terms of recommendations to tackle those issues and, and ensure that 
um, we can't duck our climate challenges, which is right at the core of the work of Food, Farm and Countryside Commission across the UK, that we have to change ways of farming and food production and supply chains in order to ensure that future generations have a world that is fit to live in. Well, it, it seems from the bill itself that the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act will be protected because it's already there, as long as nobody tries to amend it. So as it is, that shouldn't be a problem. But of course, if any attempt was made to strengthen it in the future, then the whole, the whole act could disappear uh, as an effective piece of legislation. In terms of what amendments can be made to the bill, I'm afraid the bill is so flawed, it's very difficult to know, uh, from my perspective, it's very difficult to know how, how it can be amended because the fundamental principle behind the bill is itself flawed, namely that there should be a, a drive to the bottom uh, and also that uh, devolved administration should lose control of areas that are devolved if they try to amend laws that are currently in place. Now, that's, that runs all the way through the Act, uh, the Bill, rather, unfortunately, and it will need wholesale uh, redrafting in order for it to, I think, to function properly. So I don't think, unfortunately, it is a question of you know, some amendments might make it better. I think it, it, it needs it really to be binned, recycled, recycled, <laughs> I should say, uh, and a fresh start made. It's not as if we're starting from scratch. You know, no. th there, is, th there is a plan there. There is a framework there that can be used to develop a bill that will command the confidence of the whole of the UK. Now, I mean, what's interesting here for me also in this conversation is that um, if we think about um, some environmental measures that have come through uh, through Europe in the time that the UK has been a member of Europe, and quite clearly those environmental measures, whether they were about, whether they were about uh, the Water Framework Directive, whether they were about um, cleaning up our rivers, cleaning up our seas, they lifted standards in the UK um, ahead of where... Uh, governments had historically prioritised. So is there a mechanism whereby we could do something similar, that the common frameworks could actually lift the standards in the UK to the standard to which all ministers profess support? And how, how long would that take to do? Uh, well, the answer to the question is yes, it could. Common frameworks could do just that. Uh, what we lack as well is any real mechanism where governments across the UK can agree uh, or have the forum to discuss. We've got the Joint Ministerial Committee, but that mainly is, is, an, is an, a place of argument rather than a place of discussion. If I can put it that way, it could be a lot, lot better than it actually is. So that is possible, but we have this fundamental problem where the bill as actually drafted cuts right across that. It doesn't seek agreement. It simply says whoever has the lowest standards forces those standards on the rest of the UK. Uh, that is not in Wales' interest. In Wales, it, historically, if we look at agriculture, we trade on the basis of quality. Mm. Uh, we trade on the basis of having an environment that we look after. We're not we're not bulk commodity producers. We, we couldn't be if we tried, frankly. Uh, and the the, the 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 sustainability story that lies behind much of Welsh agriculture is one that helps to sell Welsh land, for example. Yeah. Start losing that and your market advantage disappears. You're then competing with countries who have uh, far greater advantages than you do and, and farm in a far less sustainable way. Look, for example, beef from Brazil, I think anyone would, would, would argue that it's farmed in a sustainable way. Uh, and yet we run the risk of that beef potentially being allowed into the UK with any kind of controls at all. Uh, and those countries, including ourselves, who farm in a way that, that looks to, to, to work with the environment rather than against it, they get penalised. And that's not in our uh, interest. So I think that if we've, if we've got some deep and worrying elements in the bill, um, and clearly, clearly, clearly we have in the context of the kind of ambitions that I'm hearing across Wales, across sectors, um, but particularly in many ways from our farmers, you know, the ambition of the um, National Farming Union um, in order to achieve, um, you know, net zero by 2040. You know, these are big ambitions. And if we want to protect those ambitions in Wales, what is the simplest way in which we could do that? Are there any opportunities this side of the legislation for legislation in Wales to be passed? that can actually address some of these issues? 
I think the practical answer is no, um, especially with the way things are at the moment. There'll be no time to pass any legislation before this bill uh, became an, an act. In terms of the timescales here, there's no time to negotiate common frameworks before the end, before January when we leave yeah. the EU. But we could agree, of course, to keep the current EU frameworks until there was until there was an agreement. So it's not a question of there will be a vacuum unless something's agreed. You could keep what we have already and then agree something. Uh, when it comes to the to the uh, to the environment, you know, the last thing anybody would want to do is to go back to the bad old days we had in Wales. You know, when I grew up, a lot of, a lot of Wales was basically covered in dust. Covered in coal dust, the river, the town where I grew up, Bridgen, ran different colours according to who had chucked what into the river upstream, whether it was coal or lipstick or, or dye. You know, I saw it run green. Uh, they do this in Boston, apparently, in St. Patrick's Day, but we did it in Bridgen long before that. Uh, it, it caused enormous problems for wildlife. You know, the river wasn't safe even to, 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 to walk into, you know, it, it, let alone fishing. Uh, we don't go back to those days. We don't want to go back to the days when uh, our sheep meat farmers particularly were driven to produce as much sheep meat as possible because the subsidy regime uh, paid them on a hedge basis the more sheep you keep the more we pay you uh, and the environmental deg deg degradation of that was was huge yeah. and of course it meant we had far too much lamb on the market for the market to absorb so the price went down now the, we've come a long way from there and the last thing we would want for example is an agricultural policy that's dictated from one's perspective entirely by the needs of big arable farms, the big, the factories, you know, arable farms are not farms, they're factories. Uh, those, those big arable farms, the big, big, big dairy units that, that would be their interest that would be taken more into account. And then they don't work with the environment at all. They're just factories. Uh, rather than farmers who, who you know, w work in the uplands, who look to work with nature, they will be penalised because of the standards they look to keep. So, there is a mechanism, I mean, considering the hastiness with, with which this bill is being taken forward, there is a mechanism of maintaining European standards that, you know, one hopes that, in fact, when people consider the implications of this legislation, perhaps there are some opportunities to influence the creation of those common standards that are there already from the European perspective to be used while there is a proper negotiation uh, between the UK government, in this context, as you say, the English government, because agriculture powers are devolved, uh, in terms of actually engaging with other parts of the UK, in terms of taking a measured approach forward that is good for all parts of the UK and the presentation of the UK to the rest of the world. That is an opportunity as a result of the conversations that are going on in Parliament at the moment. My view is we should simply stick with the standards that we have, the European standards that we have, until such time as there is agreement across the governments, plural of the UK, to uh, keep or change those standards, but it will be a matter of agreement rather than imposition. That's hugely important. And also to avoid the situation that we have, which is this. In future, let us, let's say, for example, the Welsh Government decided to adopt a European standard in a particular area, that happened to be higher than the standard in the UK, couldn't do it because it would be forced to, uh, to follow whatever the lowest standard was in that particular area in any one part of the UK. No, that, that can't possibly be right. To take away a, a government's ability to raise standards when it comes to environmental issues or agricultural issues, that, that's, a, that, you know, that, that's a fundamental removal of what has been in the past, uh, something that's been at the heart of devolution. So the Wellbeing of Future Generations Act might be our last defence? As things stand, yes, because it's there, it wouldn't get affected, because it's already in place, it wouldn't be affected by the provisions of the Internal Market Bill if it becomes an act. But any attempt to strengthen the bill might neutralise not just uh, an amended bill, but the entire act. Carwin, I think that probably at this point, because we're still in uh, the parliamentary discussions around this bill, um, that we'll stop there. But I'd be grateful if we can repeat this conversation and consider the implications once the bill re does or does not go through in terms of, of reaching royal assent. So, Carwin, thank you so much for your wisdom. Um, I'm not sure that, I'm not, not sure you've made me any happier in the context of hearing the outcomes, but I think it's incredibly important 
that people in Wales and more widely understand um, that actually the only legislative protections we have is the legislation we have now. And if we want to change or amend that legislation, even if circumstances um, make that the right thing to do, we put the very legislation in peril. I'm not sure that that is a message that is clearly understood, and I'm really grateful to you for spelling it out so quickly. Well, thank you, Jane. I mean, just, just to encapsulate it in really in, in, one, in a few short sentences, if one part of the UK decided to allow more pollution into our rivers, then we'd be forced to do the same thing in Wales. And That's that is it. terrifying, and that would be a return to the bad old days when I came to Wales and the tap ran black because of the coal activity uh, in the valleys. Um, so thank you so much for your contribution today, and I look forward to our next discussion. Thanks, Jane.